Hello, everybody. Uh, this uh, uh, research seminar has uh, the Estonian National Museum Research Seminar today is in English. Uh, and I'm really happy to introduce uh, Sophie Peng, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Glasgow uh, and also lecturing at the uh, University of Tartu. And uh, Sophie has been uh, uh, has connections with, with Estonia for four years now. Uh, she made uh, her uh, MA thesis at the uh, Johannes Kitta Institute of uh, Political Studies at the University of Tartu, and, and, uh, and uh, it was on uh, knitting uh, tradition in Estonia. And today, uh, Sophie is uh, going to uh, present a paper uh, titled Means of Living, Me Meaning of Localness, Hand-Knitted Wool and Lace Products in Shetland, Scotland and Hapsalo, Estonia. So thank you, Sophie, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Dana. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you first for traveling to Tartu or travel all the way from other parts of town to this hall. And also thank you for coming to listen to me if you are now in front of your screen and watching the online event. Well, normally I would just write go freestyle by heart for my lectures and presentations. But I only got to know yesterday that this would be recorded and uploaded online. So. Um, I've got this eternal enemy that is stressed in front of camera, which made, made me to type in down all the important notes here. Um, I'm not going to read it like as um, if I was that kind of lecturer who can only read from PowerPoint, so don't worry. So today's lecture is designed to last for one hour, which is quite challenging for me as uh, this is my first public lecture instead of um, conference presentations, which normally would only last for 20 minutes to 40 minutes. Um, well, in fact, I always have a problem uh, regarding time limit during almost all my conference presentations. So when I need to talk something about lace knitting. So I guess finally today, there's no need for any chair or, you know, pr president to stop me to just shut me up today, which I think is a good thing. Right, um, now I would like to give an overview first for today's presentation. This lecture consists of six parts, and I will show you now each uh, titles of each part on this slide. Sorry, I'm just to move slide. Ah, yes, here. So um, that you could get a general overview of what's going on now. First, I will give a brief introduction of my current PhD degree project at the University of Glasgow. The title is Lace Up the North, Exploring the Meanings of Hand-Knitted Wool and Lace Products in Shetland and Hopsalu. <laughs> Materials which I use for today's lecture is partly from the background part, or let's say overview section of the thesis. But please don't worry, I will try not to sound as if this is a thesis, uh, you know, defense presentation. What I would like to focus today is the shared pattern, as I see, of the development process of Shetland lace and Harpsalo lace as heritage handicrafts in Scotland and Estonia. So this is a lecture about similarities rather than differences. Nevertheless, I will shed light on major difference regarding visibility of lace in the context of contemporary Shetland and Harpsalo which I think it's an interesting point that I actually surprisingly discovered rather recently from my fieldwork in both places between 2020 to 2022. I will also try to explain the reasons behind such significant difference, which I hope it will inspire further discussion during our Q&A session after my talk. I will then introduce my research questions to you, which can be simply summed up as First, how people make lace products, and um, then how lace products make quotation marks, people. I will explain in details later regarding this matter. And of course, I will talk a little bit about my research design, about how I plan to do field work so that I could answer these research questions. But please keep in mind that one thing I just mentioned that my scheduled field work in both places were taken place between 2020 to 2022. 
Um, so I guess you must know already that COVID-19 pandemic almost ruined everything. Um, frankly speaking, COVID was a major factor that my field work actually did not really go well. However, it does not matter that much at this stage. The fact that I'm here today um, in this room that I'm familiar with in my beloved museum, where I have had many happy memories studying Estonia knitting. The fact that I'm here um, ready to share my findings with all of you, despite all the unforeseeable circumstances, show that even COVID, which I think it deserves a name as one of the worst nightmares for ethnographers, even COVID cannot stop Shetland and Hapsalo to be laced up together. And I do hope that today's talk will inspire things like, for example, um, future potential collaborations if any, you know, may mayors, um, businessmen or uh, people from government, if you're li listening now, I, I hope there would be future collaborations between places where hand knitting as a heritage skill holds strong cultural importance in the region. Just a proposal. I also hope that this will help to raise awareness that importance of preserving and promoting heritage handicrafts in Shetland and Hapsalu and beyond. Right, for today's lecture, I carefully selected two key words, or let's say key phrases. That is first, as you see on the screen, means of living. And the second one is meanings of localness which is a matter of how to get a sense of belonging, form local identities and symbols. Yes, let me emphasize here the keyword symbols. And I think this is pretty accurate to bring this up here in Dartu, where semiotic studies flourish. As you see, just like how I played words by using Lace Up the North as thesis title to show my willing of putting Shetland and Hapsalu together, Shetland and Hapsalu may sound far away from each other. I guess everybody would agree with me. If you want to go to Shetland from Hapsalu, first you have to go to Darling, and then maybe travel to London, Edinburgh, or Glasgow, and then take a local air flight if you have money. Or if, like, if you were like me, you would go to Aberdeen first, and then take the overnight ferry, which 12 to 14 hours, and then finally you're reaching Shetland. So it's really, really far away. Um, but I believe they still could be laced up by a shared local speciality of hand knitted woolen lace here. Um, I try to again play words like means and meanings here to remind everyone that this part of local identity for both places are in fact, they're both originally coming from a simple motivation that is, let's be frank, um, financial support for local families. I will give a brief introduction today from both sides on how the lace making tradition formed at the beginning. However, due to um, a rather lack of solid evidence, which I have, I have gathered so far and have read from other people's work, and sometimes rather I would say questionable information from Secondhand knowledge from early years in the 19th century when people started to talk a lot and write about knitting as a craft, but rather in a, a tourist, uh, like tour, tourism or tourist or observations. So um, anyway, I think this part of study is inevitably with limitations. The actual focus of my thesis project is the exploration of meanings of localness. And it's not about uh, whether, when exactly, what is the exact date that Shetland lace tradition and Hobson lace tradition begins, because we probably don't know, like all the existing work suggests various origins. But here I'm more interested in how lace help to bring a sense of belonging and to be used as a symbol in making a local brand in contemporary contexts. Um, rather than just pulling my hair here, thinking about whether the origin of Shetland lace was really inspired by, say, Orenburg lace from Russia, which I would place a huge question mark here. Or some people say that, well, it could be inspired from that Spanish, uh, you know, there's a Spanish sh shipwreck, the myth. It could be some Spanish lace there, which inspired local people to produce the similar pattern. 
Um, by the way, I would like to mention here before the Q&A section comes that from a handful of my previous experience in talking about lace, I think it's probably to rather I would like to say before that question pops up, that is, I'm not going to talk much about uh, I'm not going to talk much about um, you know Olenburg lace today, although I've read a lot about it because well. Maybe you already know it's not even woolen lace. And today I'm talking about hand knitted woolen lace. So Orenburg lace is actually made from gold fiber and the timeline is different. So, and my specialized area after all is just um, hand knitted woolen lace products. So let's be accurate. And again, the two most famous items from this definition, this hand knitted need to be made by hand, not machine and woolen by fiber from sheep, uh, from Shetland and Hopsalu. So let's just try to keep focus on wool. Right. After the means of living and the meanings of localness part, I would like to share some tales from the field with everyone. On the Shetland part, I will share the, well, kind of personal tragedy per se of um, me going to Shetland all the way from Glasgow and then got stuck with COVID and then could not gather enough data then because of re restrictions and many things. Then ended up just living through the fact that Shetland Wool Week, you probably heard about it, it got cancelled like, well, they had it online, but the face-to-face -face event got cancelled two years in a row when I was in Shetland. But of course, uh, of course I'm not here today to complain a lot. Um, because uh, I, I guess Tenno didn't invite me here to complain. I would rather to share my observations um, of how pandemic impacted on local knitting community and what sparkled my idea regarding why Shetland lace got categorized as an endangered craft by Heritage Craft Association UK in 2021. And Hobsol lace is not on, the, on a, what we call as a red list. I argue that first, Low market, play, uh, low market price, and second, Shetland lace being overshadowed by a more visible local knitting speciality, that is the famous Fair Isle knitting, like I'm wearing today, the Fair Isle patterns. In every possible way, it got overshadowed by Fair Isle patterns. This could be some, I guess, a potential reason for Shetland lace receiving less limelight in Shetland compared to Hobsalu lace in Hobsalu. And on the Hopsalu part, since I spent significantly less time there than in Shetland, but ironically, I, get, I gathered much more data than I thought I planned. So it's quite in interesting to look into this um, incident. And I will share stories from my field observations during my interview trip in December 2021 and the participant observation during the last day in 2022. In both fields, I have received countless amounts of help from local people with kind hearts. So there's really like I'm comparing Shetland lace and Hobsaw lace, but there's no competition or comparison. Like both places received me well, especially during the hardship of a global pandemic. So here I would like also um, like to uh, on this stage of uh, Estonian National Museum, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to people of Shetland and the people of Hapsalu. Thank you all, if you're listening now, um, for helping an outsider like me to study your culture. At the end of this lecture, I will share my conclusion in making regarding the two making questions. I hope there are people from Shetland and Hapsalu who are listening to my lecture today, and maybe you would like to send some words to me, maybe you want to contribute, maybe you want to correct me, all welcome, and I will share my email address at the end. Now let's move on to the first part. Um, introduction of my degree project at the University of Glasgow. So this is my PhD project title on the screen that you could see. Um, lace up the North, exploring the meanings of hand-knitted woolen lace product in Shetland and Hapsalu, with a central focus on the process of meaning making and local identity making through lace as a heritage craft. I chose Shetland and Hapsalu as cases for two reasons. 
So first of all, it was the visual similarity that caught my attention from the very beginning. Um, give me a second, let me explain here. I, as myself, as Anita, although honestly, I always like, I, I never just, uh, I, 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 I never say like, yes, I can knit lace very well because I can't. Um, I'm not very good at knitting lace yet. I'm just good at explaining the history of knitted lace. So the, confi uh, the, the confession here I'm going to make is that um, I actually only managed to make my first successful noobs this summer, thanks to a very friendly knitter in Dardu who talked me through step by step while we sat next to Emma Yegi. As a knitter, I of course know that Shetland lace and Hopsala lace are not really the same. They do not look the same, as I say here. So I hope I'm not misguiding anyone who is listening. Um, if you have knitter's eyes, yes, they are completely different. However, back then, when I just first learned to knit in my early 20s, and rather, well, actually, I learned how to knit from uh, learning Estonian language. So it's a skill, again, accidentally gathered from my Estonian class. As a fresh knitter, I cannot really, back then, of course, I cannot really tell which one is Shetland pattern and which one is Hopsalo pattern. Technically, I mean, and because I was not advanced enough. Um, but uh, this incident eventually guided, um, well, thankfully, I think here it's not misguided. It guided me to read more about both lace products. And starting from visual similarity, I finally ended up with what I propose here today to call it a pattern similarity. And this visual pattern similarity eventually resulted in further discussion of distinctions which itself extends to a full topic regarding how heritage handicrafts would evolve and develop in the time, and which factors would accelerate or hinder the development progress. Here I display two pictures on the slide. So the Shetland one is me holding uh, my work in progress, a, a piece of beginner's Shetland lace with just basic shell patterns. At the northmost, I think that's the northmost point of uh, Shetland Isles and also the northmost point of uh, the British Isles. You can see that little tip with, um, with a, a light, lighthouse. It's Makoflaga in Anst. And well, you, you have to hike for two hours to get to the point and then hike two hours back. You cannot really drive there. Um, and then the Hapsalu one is a window of one handicraft shop. So if you're from Hapsalu, you probably know where it is. Um, in Hapsalu, it, the, the point here is it looked uh, through the window, you could look towards the Swedish market, which is the beginning point of Hapsalu's main street, Galia. Um, both pictures shows an idea of mine that Lace and la landscape, uh, lace and lands uh, landscape, they marry into each other, which is just my little symbolism here. Or let's use the appropriate Dardu language here. It's my semiotic attempts for making an argument that lace forms part of local identity for both places. Now let's move to the second reason. The second reason for choosing Shetland and Hapsalu as a pair case is that both places hold a distinctive identity, or let's say the otherness, within their own home country. So you could see I displayed, I displayed five flags here. Uh, so let's start with Shetland. Shetland locates in the crossroad where Scottish and Nor Nordic cultures meet each other. To this day, it still preserves a strong local identity influenced by its Viking past. Um, according to Britannica, uh, although in the year of 1472, Shetland together with Orkney were already annexed to the Scottish crown, the islands have never, I'm just going to give a direct quotation, uh, the, islands have never, uh, the islands have nevertheless stood outside the mainstream of Scottish history and traditions. So here I put many flags on the slide, and you can see that Shetland flag is the one on the bottom, 
The Shetland flag is not even a Scottish satire. It's a Nordic cross. It looks like the Finnish one, uh, the Swedish one, as you know. Um, although, well, I mean, it shares the same color palette with uh, Scottish blue and white. This Nordic cross is meant to symbolize Shetland's Nordic links. On the Estonian part, I put three flags. The national flag, the Hapsalu flag, and the Noalotsi flag, which I have one at home. Um, just I got from the Coastal Swiss Museum in Hapsalu during one of my many field trips. So the Swedish minority and an awareness of this shared past memory in the region shall not be missed here. Um, I'm going to cite some work from uh, Siri Raymond and Aime Etasi. According to them, in their Hapsalu Lace book, local legend, again, as maybe just a city myth, but local legend says that, well, they're from Hapsalu, so I think, okay, I could say from a Hops reliable Hapsalu source that Hapsalu Lace starts from an Estonian Swedish family. Along with some, well, there, of course, there are other legend of uh, the origin of Hapsalu lace, which suggests this lace could be either from Vormsi Vor Vor uh, region or even further from Orenburg or Benza in nowadays in Ra Russia. And um, another person who wrote a book in English about Hapsalu lace, his name is Nancy Bush, he, uh, she also mentioned this legend of Noah Lotzi family bringing lace to Hapsalu. Um, in her book. But I guess Nancy Bush, probably she got this from the same local source, which is, uh, I guess it's just uh, the same Hapsalu people keep telling people that yes, our is probably from Noalotsi, from Volotsi, from Orenburg, we don't know, but it's here anyway, it's flourish. Uh, it's, it, it's like, it's cool in Hapsalu. Um, I think it would be, honestly, it would be, I, I try to look into like maybe some sort of archives, like I went to Estonian archives, I was like, but then they say, oh yes, we have a most viewed, like a really cool video. You know, the most viewed video in Estonian National Archive is actually a Hapsalu lace knitting video. But then there are very few of the uh, records of, but I, I was like, but I need lace records and or the, so like lace pieces that survived all the things, war, Soviet occupation, like things like that, but no. Um, so I guess maybe there's something that I don't know that if you know, please do let me know. I would be very thankful. But I think it, it would be quite impossible now to tell whether, well, such myth in Hapsalu would be reliable unless I guess mm, we can only hope uh, maybe in the future some mysteriously written records suddenly just arise in reliable public or family archives, um, which we could keep our fingers crossed, but not now. Um, so we may hope that this problem will get solved in the future, but for now I will just focus on this narrative and how it contributes to uh, the Noah Nazi and the, uh, you, you know, the Swedish family coming. This, this, the, this thing, how it contributed to forming a distinctive, uh, a distinctive local identity. And I think both Shetland and Hapsalu can be deemed as margins of Scotland and Estonia, like cultural mar margins. Considering the Viking influence on Shetland identity and the Swedish impacts on the Hapsalu part. This is, I call it, an interdisciplinary study with a strong focus on identity discussions. And it also reflects my own identity as a researcher, my kind of identity crisis, or I would rather call it being mixed between humanities and social sciences, and being mixed between uh, Scottish, Shetland, and Estonian Hapsalu. So I have stated the potential research impact of this project as follows. First, as I have mentioned earlier, it's about means of living, which opens an honest discussion regarding money. That I hope it will not only just remain as papers in academia, but also br it would bring real additional income or attract funds to local heritage handicrafts people in Shetland and Hopsalu. Especially, I put my hope on the younger generation, 
because they are the future hope for preserving this heritage. And this project also contributes to literature in a lesser explored research area in material cultural studies. Furthermore, as, a, as you can see, me as a visible out outsider, visible, who happened to be I'm neither Scottish nor Estonian by birth, but I think my personal research experience on this project would contribute to the discussion of ethnography methodology. And of course, again, the COVID factor, let's bring this back. This would also spice up the methodology, like my methodology ch chapter, which um, that's another unexpected tale from the field that I save for the second part of this presentation. Now let's move on to the research questions. Um, here on the slide, you can see a three arrowed wheel. This is an idea which comes from spinning well. Uh, well, I'm not very I'm not very good at drawing, so I wanted to draw a wheel, but I just put three arrows on. Maybe I should hire someone to draw it for me. Um, so, which I think is also quite symbolical when things comes to knitting, because you will have to spin wool first to get yarn, and with yarn you could start knitting. And this will makes two research questions pushing each other forward and round and round. So the first part, people's work on lace products. The invention of this heritage handicraft dated back in the 19th century and the, the joint efforts from a whole family or several families in the region, which again, this is a starting point of a so-called community, um, a local community. And then there would be evolution of a business pattern with local characteristics and the continuity of such marvelous work till our time of the 21st century. All these elements led to form a shared sense of belonging among people who spent time and efforts in making such transition. That is the second part, how lace products work on people. Well, it's because of this continuous lace work that united local lace makers to share such spirit of being distinct distinctively a Shetland lace knitter or Hafsa lace knitter. The formation of idea that lace represents something special from both regions results in a common, uh, a common agreement, which in the end become a part of local image. Then this part of local image makes impact out with the lace knitting circle so it impacts like it's not only for knitting, it's also like for the third sector, for tourism, attract more money, people would be interested in the region and there would be positive image for the local people. So this kind of thing, which we call lo lo local identity here, it would influence back on people's work on lace products. So they would get more motivated to make it better, to make it onto another level. That is to say, um, those benefits, those money and image benefits, which it may bring uh, all the people together to keep traditional lace alive and then step forward. So you see the mechanism here with this wheel. The proposed wheel keeps going round and round because lace people make lace and lace makes like lace impacts people and then people got to make lace again. Lace goes to this is how things work. And my research motivation here is to understand how this invisible spinning wheel in the society, this mechanism works in lace industry and local community in both Shetland and Hapsalu. Next slide. Right, so I put some key points here to explain my research questions in details. To sum up in one sentence, this is a work designed to answer the following set of questions. So first, how people have created and produced lace and how people still use lace now in Shetland and Hapsalu. Why lace is such an important thing to Shetland and Hapsalu? How do people in Shetland and Hapsalu work the local lace business and how lace work in process of shaping local identities? To answer this question, I made the following research design that is on the next slide. Yes. So you can see here my mixed identity as a researcher also shows pretty clear. For the first part of this question, I 
clearly I kind of lean towards my historian identity more. And for the second one, my social scientist part of self jumps out. Regarding people to lace part, I designed some sort of like ar archive based research together with the classical method that every ethnographer uses, that is participant observation, which and I, I need to say here that um, the participant observation thing, unfortunately, most of the schedule did not happen because of COVID, of course, and I will talk about this late, later in the story time. And regarding to lace to people, I first, I formed several hypotheses from my readings, of course. Then I brought those hypotheses to the field I made some uh, sem semi-structured interview and in-depth interviews with local lace knitters. And by the way, this point, which also had some rather, I would say, surprising hard hardship that I will share later in the story time. Um, like that was one thing that I did, the, almost the only thing that I did not expect when designing this project. So after my data collection, I went back to my hypothesis to see, so experiment and then to test if this works. So I'm going to see if empirical, if empirical data confirms them, confirms those hypotheses or not. And then I would reflect on why the differences emerge from surface, like why it does not confirm what I thought, like why people told me different thing from what I read from those academic papers. Well, I mean, I would not have enough time today to share all the aspects of this project. Otherwise, I would have to just put the project title as my lecture title. So instead, I would, I choose to talk about the shared patterns between Shetland lace and Hobson lace, not, tech, not, tech, not technically about the shared patterns I want to emphasize here. For example, as you know, the cat's paw pattern, which can be found in both Shetland and Hobson classical patterns. Um, I'm here sharing the shared evolution pattern that is from a means of living back in the 19th century and to becoming the meanings of localness in our contemporary context. Now, means of living. I would to start this section from a phrase by the poor for the rich, which is not my phrase. I borrowed it from uh, the title of a lace research project you could check online. It's called Lace in Context by Nicolette Makovitsky and David Hopkins. Um, this idea applies to hand knitted woolen lace in Shetland and Harpsalu too. The exquisite lace, which can be pulled through a gold wedding ring, which I'm talking about today, is, well, surprise not surprise, it's not part of local folks' daily costume. In contrast to more visible stereotypical knitted items from Shetland, which is fair owl vest, Shetland yoke jumper, or fisherman's jersey, uh, you know, fish, uh, the fi 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 fisherman's jumpers, I want to say ganses, yeah. Fisherman's jumpers from, uh, for example, outer hybrids, etc., and also Kiknu Troy, which also happened to be a fisherman's jumper from Estonia, and other knitted woolen wear like the bright orange muhu knits. You know, um, all those have got roots from countrymen's folk clothing, but. Both Shetland lace and Hobsol lace are not invented for keeping local folks warm here. They are made for sale, for getting additional income to support families. For, well, let's go simple. It's for money. So I'm going to cite a PhD work from a colleague, Ro Roslyn Chapman from Glasgow University. In her 2015 PhD work, brilliant one, she discussed on the economic value of fine knit or fine spun items in the early 19th century, with evidence cited from travel memoirs of curious outsider visitors of that time. And another person from uh, also from Glasgow University. She has a book pu published on uh, the history of uh, Shetland knitting. Uh, her name is Linda Freya, put on the screen so that you could check if you're interested. So she also mentioned such fine scale and the hard time of the 1830s would help them to turn, help them to turn this subsistence activity into a highly marketable product. 
So you see, it's again about such highly skilled work making con like con contributions to family incomes. In fact, almost all existing work that I've went through, um, either Shetland lace or Hapsalo lace, they both show that the motivation from the starting point are all based on financial desires. It was the fact that people realizing that, well, fine knitting work, which is distinctive from the Mundan plan knitting chore, the fine local skill, it was the fine local skill would becoming sort of the ma magic money tree here for local people. Although it was never the, a great sum of cash, but it's still better than nothing. Then the skill went steps higher gradually over the years. Um, I listed several Estonian authors here, Cili Leima, uh, namely Cili Leima and Aime Edasi. Well, Nancy Bush, is, uh, she's from the US, she's not from Estonia. Well, anyway, Leima notes in the 2016 publication, Estonian Knitting, that the opportunity of selling Hapsalu shawl to rich holiday makers in the resort town of Hapsalu provided an income for many local families from as early as the second quarter of the 19th century. Well, it's more or less the same time when Shetland lace became eye-catchy. Such pattern follows. Raymond argues that the once declined during the war lace making industry had its second spring after the uh, re independent, uh, not, sorry, it's not re independence, the first independence of Estonia in 1918. And the fame spreads wor worldwide. Together with a more formed industry in the region, worked in a way that entrepreneurs, namely, um, let, let me see what Celie notes here. So, na namely, Annette Martin who herself was a master knitter, in contrary to the Shetland business middleman being dominantly from out with the circle and being men who do not knit. In, in Hapsalu, the cases, those uh, local ma master knitters, they became entrepreneurs and they would instruct and supply local knitters with yarn. And then they would sell the lace products outside Hapsalu. And I guess this sounds pretty familiar to anyone who have read about how Shetland lace knitters got paid with things like, well, not only lace knitters, but just Shetland knitters in general, got paid with things like tea or vouchers. Um, then the precious lace being brought out, out from the aisles onwards to a bigger market to make money. This is a business pattern which my supervisor, Lynn Abrams, she argues it to be of exploitation of women's labor and skills by the merchants. So basically women who made it, but men got money. And during the Soviet occupation, lace knitting is preserved in Hapsalu through the Uku Craft Cooperative. And uh, and it was quite funny because I read from, I think it, it was from Sili Leima, it was because they found out that uh, Hapsalu lace cannot be made on the machine. So they had to form this uh, group and to get the local uh, hand handicraft ma masters to preserve it, to get the pattern down, to gather little groups, because apparently you can, you, you, you can, I believe you still cannot make noobs on contemporary machine in our time, despite the technique has been advanced a lot. And also lace has been preserved overseas by Estonian diasporas. You could read more about this in Nancy Bush's note in her knitting book on Estonian lace. Um, so let's say the Uku work, the UKU, um, provides additional income for local knitters and its products traveled abroad despite, like, I think it was Silly who wrote this, um, despite people who made them were re re restricted to travel in the Soviet re Union. It's in that book, which uh, was all authored by Silly Leima and Aime Edasi out of print now, but you could find in local um, libraries if you are interested. So Hapsal Lace traveled and not only like it, it, it traveled far before the Soviet U Union. It was like be before the Soviet occupation. It's not a new thing for Hapsal Lace. It went abroad like, like for example, the shows in New York in the 1930s, I think it's 1936 and Berlin in 1938. 
So move on to the Shetland side. Things which hops are lace went through like competitions and exhibitions happened as well with Shetland lace. From local agricultural shows to grand ex exhibitions elsewhere. It was the arrival of the oil industry that we br briefly discussed before this le lecture with our audience. Um, it was the arrival of the oil industry in Shetland that like the Nor North Sea oil industry, it gradually slowed down the steps of local hand knitting industry because, well, money comes and they have more jobs and things just simply changed. The wealth comes to local community. So the hand knitting industry has been, but but the I, I'm I'm trying to explain like although there was like okay falling down, but then the hand knitting industry has been revitalized in the past few decades, um, for tourism reasons I believe, and to promote local wool. Um, now I would argue that the point is more about being local. Sometimes stereotypical here as a symbol, mainly for attract um, like people from outside the world. So it's a matter of self-branding rather than the straightforward money reason back in the 19th century. I would like to echo my supervisor Abram's writing here. Let me cite her. In present day Shetland, hand knitting constitutes one of the myths about Shetland women. And I add here such myths be it well liked by locals or not, as I've also heard that there are stories from other researchers that some may just roll their eyes when the old tale of knitting being brought up again and again and again by outsiders. This is the indispensable part of contem contemporary Shetland brand marketing and also for Hapsalu the same. Although from my personal experience that people in Hapsalu seem to be more eager in making lace a thing for local image than in Shetland nowadays. And I will leave this discussion la later or maybe the Q&A part. So furthermore, one shared trick, I call it trick, but I think it's really a um, mar marketing method that both Shetland and Hobbs are lace knitters used for boosting price, market and the visibility of their handicraft skill is the royal and celebrity way of promotion. So Shetland Lace earned its high society reputation in the 19th century after being purchased by members from aristocratic circle, even as high up as Queen Victoria. In such way, the fashion and fame spreads quickly. Hobbs of Lace also has a past of first being endorsed by visitors from Russian imperial upper class circle who spent their summer days in the seaside resort town in the 19th century and early 20th century. And then again, the, 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 this piece of local lace was being gifted to foreign royalties and celebrities, namely King Gustav Adolf of Sweden in 1932, when he was still a crown prince. And this is where the classical Hapsalu pattern crown prince came from. Even nowadays, this tradition is still alive in Hapsalu and skilled local knitters still produce personal patterns for Estonian presidents or their partners. Personally, I'm honored, quite, I'm, I'm quite honored to have my wedding dress knitted by one of Hapsalu's lace master, Sidi Lehman, who is also a, a author of the book. And she designed and knitted the pattern for ex-president Kirsty Kaliolite in 2017. I will now move on to the part of forming meaning of localness. So since we're talking about meanings here, I shall start with some semiotic talks. Semiotics is a discipline that focuses on science and communication. It originally emerged from linguistic studies, but now has already evolved into a multi and interdisciplinary notion that spans from biology to social sciences. So in a nutshell, semiotic theories could apply to any subject that involves studying a certain science system and its interpretations. Such system can be the tangible, for example, a group of animal could form a semiosphere, or intangible, for example, a set of animal behaviors could also form a semiosphere. Well, in this, in a mini-making process, every element matters. 
And what makes a certain object a symbol for a certain meaning is exactly the subtext that one shall study underneath the cultural elements. Such elements can be colorful and varied in postures, which could hide the logic of formation under the cover of excessive amount of information. I aim to explain the reasons for treating hand-knitted lace as part of semiosphere of Shetlandness and Hobsol lace, that is, meanings of localness that I propose here. There are three reasons that make semiotic studies relevant to the study of hand-knitted lace in the context of constructing local identities in Shetland and Hobsol. So first, let's follow the classical Lotman's argument on cultural texts. I explain in a way that hand-knitted lace can be deemed a means of communication both between knitters and its land. So this is why I put uh, a lace in a landscape at the beginning of my presentation. And, 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 and the communication between the outside observer and the observed land, the observed community. And hand-knitted lace can also be used as symbol when the intangible Shetland and Hapsalu local identities, like what are we talking about here? Like why Shetland and Hapsalu, why it's so different? It needs a tangible representative to be presented in wider cultural contexts, and, and lace can serve as a symbol. And I also follow Holt and Kress 1988 text here on social semiotics. I argue that the signs that are related to hand-knitted lace, that is, lace pieces, stories, technic notes, people who engage in the life circle of lace, like who knit it, who give it to other people, who receive lace as gift, who dress lace for important occasion in their life, that is the, that is the life circle of lace and photos and how lace being presented in museum, to name a few. So all of these elements shall be deemed of semiotic importance. By studying such material, um, materialized signs within the context of local history, hand-knitted lace become part of the semiosphere or science pool, like a pool for signs, for both Hapsalu and Shetland. So consequently, lace is important in forming such so-called local identity. The last text I'm mentioning here, I follow Castle's 1997 text on definition of identity. So I assert here that hand-knitted lace can be seen as a cultural symbol that not only makes Shetland and Hapsalu outstanding from their own home countries, but also explains the importance of having a mixed identity as described earlier, like I put the flags here, like why they're different from other places. So there's a mixed identity matter. We think for Shetland, we think Scotland, and for Hapsalu, we think Estonia. So in the case of hand-knitted lace, I believe that it serves as a tool to make the fixture, uh, like this object we cannot touch, we cannot see, the object of local identity into subsistence. So for non-local people, such um, like this material would meet the demand of recognizing Shetland and Hapsalus otherness, like when we see Lesuk, oh yes, this is something Shetland, oh yes, this is something Hapsalu. And on a more down-to-earth point, it really just offers something like for tourists to purchase as souvenirs, like we want something typically Shetland or typically Hapsalu, then we go and buy lace. So the wheel will go around and around. And uh, so by doing this, they would obtain, like local people would obtain a feeling of being part of the, the making of local symbol. And the visitors would also obtain a feeling of being like a taster of local hi hi history of, and, and, and the local identity. So here is the bond bonding. And such formation and interpretation process of cultural texts make a close cycle of meanings, as well as all parties and elements that engaged in the targeted activity, and in this case, it's lace knitting. So I have a full subchapter on these meanings like semiotics, theory, and I guess I, I think I'm not going to give a really, really long lecture and in a rather boring and plan voice and reading all the citations out uh, because I would like today what I would like to emphasize is I want to make Shetland Hapsalu lace um, 
relate to each other. I want to promote this shared pattern that I propose in my thesis, and I want to raise awareness. I want more people to know about Shetland and half cellulase. So I will probably save this part um, later for the Q&A session, or maybe you could write to me, um, write me an email and I could share more, because I really want to skip to the tales of the uh, uh, tales from the field. And I'm a little bit, again, like even with one hour time, I just, I just cannot. So now it's a story time and I'm not going to read from my notes. I will just go freestyle. So first, some tales from the field, Shetland part. And I want to note that there's a huge COVID factor here. So the whole field, ex uh, the whole field uh, trip experience was quite abnormal. It's not, it's not what I would ex expect to see and to experience in Shetland. And I believe this is also quite strange for local people in Shetland. So first of all, when I arrived in Shetland, I, I put advertisements everywhere because I need to get local lace knitters to talk to me. And I even like I even re reached to the higher portals, like like not only putting my pole posters and uh, um, shop windows, like people from Shetland, if you happen to live in 2021, if you happen to live in Shetland, you probably see some really um, like my pole posters because I, I ha handmade it to attract more attention. But unfortunately, it was not a very successful story. And then I even made onto the Shetland Times the local newspaper and BBC Shetland but then I still cannot get enough lace knitters. And I, I, have, I have my hypothesis and the series on this matter. Like I think there are rather less lace knitters than Shetland and there are more la la lace knitters in Hafsalu. So I was like, really my, la my lace knitter uh, thing went super smooth in Hafsalu, but I spent a lot of time and tears in Shetland. And, but, uh, well, although I didn't get enough lace knitters, and even there are some people who, who are lace knitters, but they don't want to say they are lace knitters in front of me, and they don't want to be interviewed by me, which is quite interesting. And, but I also, I met a lot of kind uh, local people in Shetland. They try to ha help a quite desperate PhD student out by bringing their family heirloom for me to have a look so that I could like, it's kind of, I went, I went into some sort of family archives and I saw really treasured pieces that you may not see uh, uh, elsewhere because it's just in someone's drawer. And well, again, I, I don't want to complain, but Shetland War Week canceled twice. And once after I left Shetland, it's back. So Shetland War Week happened this year and I was really, really sad for not being able to be there. Um, because, well, I was in Estonia and it was, and I was in Glasgow, so it was really, I simply couldn't afford. And then there's another, an, an, another story that, as I mentioned, that Shetland lace is quite downpriced, like it's, I would say, rather cheap, because I found some lace scarf being sold in local shops and it was like uh, 30, 40 pounds for a lace scarf and I think it's really, really not good. And people don't believe me when I told them, like, you know, your hourly rate could be maybe just one pound fifty cents or two pound fifty cents. And they, they didn't believe me. And I once calculated hourly rate in front of a lace knitter to prove that I'm not talking rubbish. And then they realized, wow, we like yes, it's so low. And I said, yes, it's very low. And I think this is why because younger generations, they cannot really make a living by doing these lace related things. So this is why we don't have enough lace knitters, I guess. And also on a te technic ma matter, I tried to make lace as a way to get into local community, like to get to know local knitters, to let people to trust me so that I'm not ri writing ra ra random things with lots of mistakes. But then, because I hold, because the story is, I learned how to knit from my Estonian teacher. So I hold lace, uh, so I hold my knitting needles in Estonian way. 
and in Shetland they hold knitting needles in a different way, and they put yarn on a different. Like you cannot really see it. Like I couldn't see it, although I've seen so many lays from archives. I still couldn't tell what what went wrong when someone like a very experienced a master knitter told me, I noticed that you're knitting wrong. I will help you to sort it out and she just put everything like, and then she fixed everything and then it turned out to be a little tiny little twist that I was like but I can't see it but she can see it and I think that's a really in interesting part and also how I hold needle being considered as not a proper Shetland way it's an Estonian way it also sparks some discussion and of course the incident of strong gale of angst um, I almost lost my phone in Anst, not because someone st stolen, uh, someone steal it. No, it's very safe there. It's because the wind was so strong when I went on field trip over there. So I finished my interviews. I got all the recordings, and then I couldn't, I couldn't find my device because it's gone. And I was like, I had huge panic. And then local people, they like. It's like really tight, tight, uh, tightly knitted community. So they were just phoning each other, saying, "Have you seen this phone?" and so on. And in the end, the phone was on the on the street because when I hopped off the the car, the wind just smashed on onto me, and it was so strong that my phone was securely placed in my pocket, but the wind still managed to get it out. But I got it back, so the the empirical data is still there. Don't worry. And there's a story linked to Estonia. So there's someone from Estonia that I'm still, uh, as I hold a mission from uh, my host who hosted me in Shetland. She told me that someone stayed with them and happened to be from Estonia, and they brought Estonia hopsal lace to them. And then the hopsal lace got displayed uh, by like local community in the Anst Heritage Center. And then me as an Estonian visitor, uh, come again, so they would like to get back to the Estonian, like the previous Estonian visitor, and then they gave me address, but I couldn't find them in Tartu. So there's a mysterious link between the traveled Estonian lace to Anst. Um, that uh, I think it's a really uh, warm little story to tell. And uh, and the last point, I've heard one very um, I don't think this would be a link, but I might be wrong. So someone actually brought it up, like maybe there's a link between the word hapsalo and hap. Because the lace shawl in Sh Shetland local dialect, like, like they have a really di distinctive uh, language. Um, so local people call it hap. And then, because I keep talking about hapsalo lace in Shetland, so there was a one local person come to me saying, don't you think that there could be something linked with Hapsalu, with our local word Hap? And then I was like, yeah, but I don't speak Sh Shetlandic and I, I'm not sure. So I looked into this matter a little bit. I, I couldn't find any link now. So if you know, please do let me know. But it's quite interesting, like you just bring this up and people suddenly they just connect the word Hapsal lace with their local lace, ha local la la lace Hap. And it sounds similar, there could be something here. And on the picture, it's a piece of very old Shetland fine lace, thanks to Heritage, uh, uh, thanks to Anst Heritage Center to let me take this picture, like really close, because I have to get really close to take this picture. As you can see, this is my left in index finger for scale, so it's a quite small one. and. It's still like my finger is still bigger than the sh pattern in the, this piece of lace. So you can imagine how fine it is and it's amazing. And okay, this is the piece of evidence that I did try to look for lace knitters in Shetland, but uh, well, I think it's more of a matter that COVID really. Anyway, there's, uh, I will just finish some tales from the field, Hapsalu and uh, give a brief sum up and stop here. So I want to note here that I do have existing ties with Hapsalu before I go to field trip, and I had no existing ties with Sh Shetland. So this might contribute to the fact that I suffered more in Shetland than Hapsalu. 
So this could be the reason. It's nothing to do. It has nothing to do with maybe lo local things. It's just because people in Hapsal will know. Like I'm. Yeah, like you can see this fo photo from thanks to Hapsal Lay, Lay Center. The uh, Nit Nit Night this year. Good Uh Yeah, I'm uh, one of them. So I participated in it, and I know most of people there. And of course, you will have less hustle if you know them well. So what puzzled me the most is that the difficulty level, well, puzzle not puzzle, but the recruiting process of this research project, it's like completely different. It's, I spent maybe like two weeks in total in Habsalu and I got so much data and I spent one year and four months in Shetland and I couldn't get enough uh, Lay, lay sneakers to get like in-depth in, in interview. And by the way, I do have really helpful gate, gatekeepers in both places, which is like those people who brings people to you. And in, in Hubsaw, it's like, oh, do you want like this person want to talk to you and this one and this one and this one. And in the end, I have to re reject someone because she's under 18 years old. And according to my my I, I think application cannot talk to anybody under 18. So, um, and the biggest safety hazard to my research equipment, as I mentioned, in Anst was wind. And the biggest safety hazard in Habsalu was cold air. Um, or I don't know why I decided to schedule a work, work trip in December last year. And also this followed by some more unexpected problems regarding the Omicron variant when I travel back to Shetland, which is another story. And in Habsalu, I happen to get interviews done with a mixture of languages, that is a mixture of um, English, uh, Estonian, and Ru Russian. So I speak these three languages, but I speak better English. And my Estonian is like, I understand if you speak slowly, but if I want to go back to you, I, I need some time. And my Russian is OK, but then it's like also not as strong as English. So I didn't want to use Russian at the beginning. So I was I tried my best to use Estonian and with some help with in English and honestly English together with Estonian. But then when lo when the ni nice local ladies they they sensed my struggle with Estonian and then they started to ask oh why you and the story flows and then they know that i went to russian institute so they would for like to help me they they would sometimes switch uh, language to to russian or, 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 although like i tried my best to keep it within estonian english and i think this is really in interesting point and in my methodology chapter i also put place a discussion of such language use and why I decide to do it on my own with this uh, language that I'm not like, I, my Estonian is actually not strong enough to do very, very in-depth talk. But I still, I don't want to bring any research assistant, not only because I don't have money. The unforgettable night of knitting. Yes, it's here. And I'm very happy and very thankful that Habsalu community received me as one of us. I hope so. <laughs> And um, another story is that I went to the Hops of Late Lace Day this August. I went to just for taking some observation notes, but local knitters, they were very keen on getting me involved and uh, let me to get the first hand uh, experience of Hops of Lace. So I ended, I ended up participating in a lace knitting competition, although I just knit, uh, I, I just learned how to knit noobs like maybe two weeks ago before my trip. So I think that's a really nice gesture and also shows the willingness of uh, promoting hops or lace to uh, visitors from outside world. So this is my conclusion in progress. Let's go back to my research questions. Um, how people work on lace products, I proposed this means of living pattern, that is the usage of lace, the life circle of lace, and I investigated a little bit regarding business activity patterns and lace being used as a means of promotion. And regarding the lace product work on people part, I, I proposed the, this element on the wheel, the, uh, the merry-go-around wheel, uh, meanings of uh, localness, that is 
It helps to develop a shared local identity in both communities back in the 19th century and in our time. It symbolized the distinctive localness in Shetan and Habsalu, which I discussed a little bit in the uh, semiotic part. And also it helped to attract attention from outside world, which would benefit to local communities. And there are some lessons learned from field, which when I go back to my research questions. So my, my uh, arguments are, lace knitting as a local speciality and heritage craft indeed plays a significant role in forming a shared local identity, both in Shetan and in Habsalu. However, the percentage of how much lace knitting has contributed to local identity in Shetan and Habsalu is not on the same level. And Habsalu is like a bigger part and Shetland because they have fair out, they have other like more visible parts or so lace become a little bit more invisible. Uh, I also tried to make some reasons for the surprising outcome. I argue that Hopsalo lace has better visibility than Shetland lace because first there's no local rival for Hopsalo lace. You go to Hopsalo, of course, for Hopsalo lace. But in Sh Shetland, the Shetland lace has got a local rival that is too strong to fight with that I'm wearing today. And but Shetland lace knitters, they do have, oh, sorry, there's a typo. Shetland lace knitters have um, better publicity, of course, in English speaking world. And like, they are so famous that I, I put this reason back to the problem I got in the field. I think it's because Shetland lace knitters have been interviewed too much that some knitters, they probably, they just don't want to be interviewed repetitively. Be, okay, you just go to other people who in interviewed me. I think that was the matter. And I think on this matter, Hapsal Lace still got ways to go. But uh, as we all know that um, loop as Estonian word is uh, wi widely used by English speaking word of uh, knitting community. So I guess the future is pretty bright for Hapsal Lace. And the main reason for Hapsal lace nature outnumbers Shetland lace nature is first better education. So in Hops, like the state fund funded system for the handicraft course in schools in Estonia and in Shetland, well, they, ha they, they have the similar thing, but the funding was like up and down, up and down. And they have a local initiative called Shetland Billy Mackers, Shetland small knitters, like young knitters. And it's run by, um, trust and uh, run by local uh, volunteers, not uh, government uh, uh, employed handicraft teachers. So that, that, that's a different. And also uh, in Estonia, you just, in Estonia, you just simply get better textbook uh, regarding teaching knitting to school children and the newly published the Gudumine, that book, like it even in, includes some QR code. So you can just scan and you could see how this got made. And I think it's really good for preserving such um, heritage. And of course, vocational training, as uh, we know, like you can learn from Dartu University, where I work now. And also there are uh, cultural institutes and also like uh, uh, summer camps and also like night night classes and I think it's more organized here in Estonia on a state level and compared to Shetland it's a bit more of voluntary and uh, not as uh, intense as here as I observe. And last but not least the COVID factor for this project which unfortunately got field work from 2020 to 2022 it's definitely not the best time and this surprising part it's like, could just be my bad luck. So I think it does not change the core conclusion, which reflects back to the research questions. Like those surprises do not, they do not disqualify my opinion regarding the wheel mechanism, as I explained before, of people and lace, people and lace, like how they work on each other. And I think I'm quite happy. Well, I'm not actually happy, but I'm quite happy in a way that I got all this surprising stuff, which open how how helped me to develop and open further discussion on the lace heritage preservation method. And I hope this would be helpful for local people and for people who are interested in lace heritage. 
That's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sophie, for this very, uh, very interesting presentation. Now we have about uh, 15 minutes for uh, for Q and A. Some uh, questions. Uh, so. Also, uh, the people from uh, from online can uh, have questions, but uh, please. Actually, if if I may, I uh, I have some questions. Okay. First of all, can you open the phone, please? First of all, like uh, it was uh, very interesting for me that uh, that you. Uh, the focus on, on production and focus on profit. Um, uh, this was very interesting for me. And uh, you also mentioned that uh, in your research, you you have uh, kind of, uh, um, how to say, applied aims to, to kind of help leaders and, and uh, help this tradition to, to, to stay alive. Uh, and you, you mentioned that uh, in Shetland, uh, the Shetland lace is often very inexpensive, so uh, so the knitters uh, get very little money, unfortunately. Uh, so, uh, what what's the situation in Hapsalo lace, and uh, what uh, actually uh, we can do about it? Oh, okay, it's about the profits, which I think is a really good question because. I found it really interesting that um, in Hapsalu, like lace knitters, they would like when I when I bought my wet wedding dress from uh, Hapsalu lace knitter, they priced me by hourly rate. Like they 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 said we cannot give you a price at the beginning because we need to count how many hours we work on it. So they got the awareness of my work need to be uh, valued on how much time I put into it. But in Shetland, as far as I'm concerned, from my casual conversations or like, come on, if there's like a scarf, like the, these long and although with like, okay, simple patterns, yes, but but 40 something, that's a bit sad. And and when I bring this up to local people, like they're not aware of like how, how little they earn per hour. And I think, well, in Hapsalu, you can buy like, those traditional lace show from half so lace need uh, uh, lace center i'm not sure how much they price now like um but when i was there in 2017 i think it was a little bit over 100 euros like 120 something like that and well let's say in in estonia the average salary is lower than average salary in scotland but if you just look at the lace price, um, half of the lace knitter could earn more than average Shetland lace knitter. And I think the core factor is that half of lace knitters, for some reason, they got the awareness of I count this by hours, not by piece. Whereas Shetland lace knitters, they would rather count by piece. Like they would, like one business pattern is some knitters they would knit at home, then they bring to local stores like souvenir stores and handicraft stores. And then the store will sell it and the knitters, uh, they, will, they will get money back. For this pattern back in the old time, it was like I mentioned sometimes, it, 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 it's not a case now, but historically they were just get paid by things like tea or vo voucher to spend in the store. Like they were basically exploited. So maybe such exploitation pattern or exploitation history like was the reason for not uh, like not looking at the, the piece in hourly rate rather just okay I made this piece I, I get some money and and also some people they just say we are not working on and this all also happens with Hapsalu people like we are not like this is not our day job we make it for additional income but I think the Shetland narrative now is more about kind of hobby like, okay, I made it as a hobby, so I'm happy that I get money. But the Hapsalu initiative is like, uh, yes, there's a lace center. I make things for lace center. I get money from it. And I will have to count my hours. 
like my my uh, wedding dress costs I, I can't remember the exact hours like hundred something hours that's a lot of time and uh, they are aware of that and I'm very happy of this awareness and I I hope I hope more people would like know that yes this is solid work and actually very skilled work and it deserves more thank you uh, there is one question uh, online from Marika Marif Marifa Sakos, please. Uh, you are uh, muted currently. Hello, hello. 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 I am Marifa. Um, I am an Estonian living in uh, Shetland. And I, I am so I'm so grateful for this your uh, um, presentation. It's it's absolutely fantastic. And that, my question is, do you intend to come with the same um, lecture to uh, Shet? Oh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I wish there would be a chance sometime. Like I really, I really like Sh Shetland, and I hope there would be a chance. And I still. I have my local connections there, and sorry, I didn't meet you in Shetland. When, like, oh, I, 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 yeah, I thought Shetland would be such a small community, and yeah, I know one Finnish person in Shetland that we tried the experiment that she spoke Finnish to me, I spoke Estonian to her, and we tried to understand how much, yeah. Yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm so happy to know that there is at least one Estonia in Shetland. And Sophia, I'm going to take your email address. And yes, definitely. yes, please. Absolutely, that's it's wonderful. It's the it's the beginning of uh, cooperation. I Thank hope so. <laughs> yeah, like I have my my big dream of maybe one day I could help with like maybe training Shetland and Hapsalu, like training Lovik with Hapsalu, you know, through or training Anst with Hapsalu. Absolutely. So, yeah. <laughs> That's and, and and then lace lay, knitters could travel like yeah. this year to uh, Shetland to Hapsalo, yeah. the next year Hapsalo to Shetland. Yeah, absolutely. And the wool week just ended. It was a, a end of September, and mm -hmm. it absolutely. You know, I have no words to describe it. It's it's fantastic. You know, uh, and, I, I missed out this year. It's and also for Estonian handicrafters and and the researchers. It's an amazing opportunity, very unique. And uh, what really fascinates me about Shetland is that we we have sheep here. We have the raw material walking on the fields and how, you know, the, the crofters come together and they trade different uh, wool and how the thread is made. You know, I found it so fascinating. It's like uh, lace is the final product. But then we start from the material which is uh, grown here. So yes. it's, just, it's probably the same in Estonia as well. We have our own um, uh, sheep there. But you know, the awareness does actually, the, you know, the material is the basis of lace, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know more about it. So Yes, I do agree. And I also, I have a, a small discussion in my uh, now I'm wor working on the final draft of my thesis and I, I do have a small discussion regarding the wool question because of course um, on the Shetland they, they matter is uh, all about local wool, local sheep like they survived this harsh uh, climate like okay you, you know the strong wind that can just kick my phone out, out of my pocket and they, they would pick um, like they have really, really fine fleece and they pick only from the, uh, I've been told it's from the neck part, the back ne neck part, because it's the finest fleece from the local ship and they will spend, and it's supposedly the finest thread is come, comes from Ernst and this is why Shetland lace is a kind of an Ernst thing, like the best one or famous one is from the nor northmost part of the Isles. And for the Hapsalu part, well, there are many legends, really, and if the city myth of Hapsalu was true, that it all starts with some uh, Swedish connections, a Swedish lady or lady from no lot whatsoever, then uh, coastal Swedes they have um, like they have been keeping Estonian na native sheep as well, 
And uh, I think if this was real, which we have no way to, like, it's really just a discussion of whether there would be a possibility. It could highly likely, it could be from their ship, their local Estonian native ship, or mm. maybe from uh, those uh, yarn which imported from Riga. And as back then in the 19th century, the steam line between Riga and those coastal towns and already was the same. So yes, there is a link. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions from, from the audience here? Yeah, please. Yes. Say, please. Uh, yeah, I would like to uh, continue with this income and subsistence theme that then I brought up. So you said that um, uh, in Shetland at present the, the Shetland lace is sold quite cheap, uh, and also that it is uh, competing with Fair Isle items well, on the market, so to say. So is Fair Isle knitted objects? Uh, are, are they sold uh, at a higher price? At a higher price. So, is 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 it, is it more profitable for a knitter to make perile uh, knitted objects than to make Shetland lace? Well, thank you for your question. Uh, honestly, I did not really investigate into fair uh, knitwear because for various reasons, like the one I'm wearing now is from Ann Anderson's in Shetland and also they sell similar things in Jamieson's, like those local shops. So it's rather the local, the real, I would say, Shetland fire our jumper. But because this fire our style has been uh, promoted and like people just like it and even there was a drama I, I, I have to double check but recently I think there was a French fashion house forgot if that was Chanel or like those very expensive one like they went to fair out they steal local pattern and they made onto their runway and it was like a huge local go gossip which um, like I like to investigate into these little things but um, so as I say uh, this kind of fair isle pattern, it was not only uh, made by Shetlanders in Shetland. Now it's like, for example, there's a luxury Scottish clothing brand called Brora. They also like, they make um, fair isle patterns with uh, cashmere, which it's not a traditional uh, material for fair isle knitting, but it's like fair isle inspired rather. But this kind of fair isle, like, can we call it a fair product or not? And also like local people, for example, the, this cardigan, like I've been told like only this part is hand knitted and the rest is machine knitted. So if you're just going to make it, you definitely you spend less time to make this part than to make a full lace. Because I think technically I might be wrong, but from my own experiment, like my Estonian teacher is there. She knows that I could knit this kind of fair isle thing three, three or four months after first I learned how to knit. But uh, for lace, it really takes a lot of time. So I personally, I think fair isle technique is easier than knitting lace. So if you are making it as a means of living, um, you definitely will make more Fair out, like with the same time, maybe, okay, say I work 10 hours the, this day, maybe I need a lot if I need fair out. But for lace, like also it's really difficult to concentrate on lace and it's easier to make um, mi mistakes because in lace, it's all white and it's like a little pattern you cannot see and the fair out, like if you make a mi mistake, you notice immediately on the second row, but in lace, maybe you need many rows. Oh, oh no. Yeah. So, I, I don't know really. I, I can tell you like this kind of car cardigan now. Uh, it's on the price uh, on on the uh, it it comes with a price tag at around a po uh, like a jumper would be well. But my case is like I I always have like a XRS or like a really small size, so it's cheaper. Uh, but it's normally between like sixty five to ninety five pounds, and this one was like. 80 something, yes, so it's not cheap, but definitely not expensive enough to make a good profit for people who make it. Yeah. 
Thank you very much for this uh, very fascinating talk, and, and also th thank you very much for uh, for the discussion, which was which is also uh, like very interesting and also very uh, say essential, you know, important to to keep those traditions alive. So thank you very much, and uh, and um, uh, thank you for participating both offline and online. Bye.